Father's Day to all our fathers and uh, most of all our Heavenly Father. Praise God. Amen. I guess on Mother's Day we should celebrate the church, the New Jerusalem, the mother of us all. And uh, Father's Day, of course, our Heavenly Father. Today we're going to talk on the subject of man. Let's everybody just say man. 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 Manhood has been under assault by the devil for many decades, probably ever since the Garden of Eden, actually. Psalm verse 8, the 8th Psalm. Verse number 4, the 8th Psalm. We find that this is to the chief musician upon Gittith. And many people have different understandings of what Gittith was. Gittith was... Uh, a euphemism for Gath. So some people think this is a psalm that David wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost after he had killed Goliath from Gath. Uh, also, Gittith means the wine press, and the wine press was a joyous occasion. The three other times Gittith is used as a subtitle in uh, Psalm 8, and then two other times, Psalm 81, Psalm 84, it's very joyous and thankful. Psalm. Some would say that it was a musical instrument that was given to David while he was at Gath and that God caused him to, as David, the book of Amos, says that David actually created musical instruments. It's in the Minor Prophets, I think it is Amos. And th this would have been one of the minor, this would have been, excuse me, one of the instruments that he created. But in Psalm 8, verse 4, we find this rhetorical question to God. What is man that thou art mindful of him? Now you have to realize David's circumstances. He was a shepherd. Shepherds spent a lot of time outdoors. This was before there was a lot of light pollution, before electricity. So he could just look up at the stars. One of the things I really enjoy doing is getting out in the country. And looking up at the stars, you can see them. I think the most stars I've ever seen, it may be a tie for, for uh, you know, for two different times. One time we were flying above Iran, and it was on a missions trip. And we were 39,000 feet in the air, and I had a window seat. And so 39,000 feet, it was dark. I'm sitting there looking, and I could see the Milky Way very plainly. And I'm just like, okay, this is amazing. People tell me that I'm part African, missionaries tell me, because what Africans do, they said an American, when they walk somewhere, like when they walk outside, they're like this. They said Africans, when they walk outside, they look up. I always look up <laughs> when I look, because I'm looking at stars and different things such as that. The other time we were out in as far southeast Louisiana as you could get, and we were in the swamps at night. We had got the wild hair that we wanted to spend the night down there until we realized it was just little Cajun fishing villages. There was no place to spend the night. And so I just told Sister Waldron the interstate was fairly quiet, like almost nobody out there. I said, just pull off the, the emergency side. I just got out. Look, it was an amazing sight. Well, this would have been David. He would have been constantly looking up. So this is also, Dr. Chalmers said this would be called the astronomer's psalm as well. So David is asking after being outside and being able to look at the vastness of outer space, he's able to say, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Now that term mindful, if you follow that, word through the scripture, which we may look up a couple of scriptures, it means his mind full of him. That there are times when God, who is omnipotent, his mind is full of us. Now I don't want us to think of this in an arrogant way, a prideful way, but it is just plainly taught in scripture that Jesus did not come down, God did not come become a man for angels, he didn't do it for cherubs or living creatures, he didn't do it for any other beings but mankind. And because we were the federal head, because we had dominion over the animals, the very animals will be redeemed in a certain sense as well. Romans 8 says the whole creation groaneth and travaileth together. And when I say animals will be redeemed, they're not going to be a resurrection of animals. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about there's going to be a day in this world 
where you know the lion and the uh, calf are going to play together, and the fox and all that. It's going to be a total redemption of the created order because mankind is federal head of the human race. So what is man that thou art mindful of? I'll tell you what we are. We're a little lower than the angels, but we're in the image of God. We're in the image of God. And so God cares deeply about us. He, as a matter of fact, on the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, he says, well, if he considers every sparrow, he's got the very hairs of our head numbered. So that's amazing. You know, an average human head has between 130 and 370,000 hairs on it, depending on various factors. <laughs> and God's got them all numbered. I love it. So what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? <clears throat> son of man, that you visit him. God would make visitations in the Spirit in the Old Testament and in the New Testament He came as a human. I wonder if we could, let's just pray together, ask the Lord to do everything He wants to do with us today. God, I glorify You. I love You. Open our eyes to what biblical manhood is in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. What You say in Scripture about men. God, let men retake their rightful place in this society and in every sphere of existence, O oh God. Let us all play the role that you want us to play. You created us with purpose, O oh God. And that very basic purpose is to please you, to serve you in the biological identity you created us with. In Jesus' mighty name, I glorify you, I praise you, I exalt you, I glorify you in Jesus' name. And let's everybody say amen, and why don't we thank the Lord for his goodness again. Praise God. The study of mankind is known as anthropology. You've heard that term. It's in colleges and even high schools. It comes from a Greek term, anthropos. It means man. So the study of mankind is anthropology. In Oregon recently, they just allowed people to say they are non-binary. And what that is, is binary is two. And so you are either a male or you're a female. Now, there has never, to my knowledge, in recorded history, not even in Sodom and Gomorrah, did they ever fight for transgendered rights. They got to homosexuality and said that's abomination enough. And so we, we've taken a step. Now, maybe they did. It's just not recorded in Scripture that they did. And so now men and women can say they are gender fluid and say whatever I feel like at any time, you have to call me that. And, and I have to use your restrooms by that. And if you deny me, if you fail, if you're obviously a biological female and you say, and, and for 364 days you have said I identify as a female, and then one day you walk in your job and say, I identify as a male today. If somebody misses and accidentally calls you what God created you, there can, you can sue, you can get lawsuits. And so it's just literally the definition of Isaiah 5 that this is a day people call evil good and good evil. Some people are celebrating the fact that Hillary Clinton became the first woman that was nominated by a major presidential party in the United States to actually win her nomination to run for president. Somebody else pointed out said, well, it no longer means anything because she might say she's a man tomorrow or other people say that they're men. And so with gender fluidity, nothing means anything anymore. And this is the basic attack on Christianity in the state of Oregon. They said, now, you don't even have to identify as binary. It's not even male or female. You can say you are now non-binary, which means you may be a goldfish, which has special protected rights, or, or an eagle. And uh, since they are protected species, you cannot be whatever. 
anymore. This is, this is, can you believe, once you leave the Word of God, just like preachers said for generations, once you leave it, you have no basis for morality. And George Washington said this in his farewell address. He said, once you divorce morality from Scripture and the Word of God, it's a dangerous supposition because it's what everybody does what's right in their own eyes. And so there's chaos and confusion. I think it's the city of New York that has uh, 40 different gender possibilities that you can fill out. You can identify as one of 40 different gender possibilities. Facebook recently, I don't know if they changed, had 36 different, if my memory serves me correctly, it was 36 different things. Now I'm just going to make a statement. Now, I never thought in an apostolic church anywhere that I'd have to make this statement. God created you either a man or woman. Amen. There's no third way. Now, some people say through biological corruption, there are certain people that are born with certain biological things. But still, those people, if you study their DNA, they are still either male or female. They just have a certain corruption in their body. And so, and that is not to speak ill or demean them. They could not help that. That was just how they were biologically created. It is because of genetic entropy that our gene pool is becoming more and more corrupted over the centuries with different mutations. And that all extends back to the fall. Scientists call the fall the second law of thermodynamics. That things are going from a more ordered state to a less ordered state. So I want to encourage you, you're either a man or you're a woman. And with that, there are certain factors that God wants you to fulfill. If you are a man, you are to play one role in the unfolding drama of redemption. If you are a female, you are to play another role in the unfolding drama of redemption. And so it is not that either are superior. Yes, the Bible clearly says in 1 Corinthians 11 that the head of every woman is the man. So women, even if you're unmarried, you still have a man who is at headship, whether it's your father, your minister, your pastor, someone is your head, your spiritual head. That does not imply inferiority. Equal but different, equal but separate roles. So headship, when we think headship, we automatically think, well, that means someone is the tail. That is not the case. So headship is simply an ordering of God that shows you have the Spirit of God, the man Christ Jesus, all men everywhere, all ladies everywhere, and that men and women play different roles. Today we're going to look at the role of a man. Let's everybody say a man. Okay. Now people have different thinking processes of what men are. And it is a scientific fact that through cultural hegemony, for lack of a better term, through cultural appropriation, through just the world fitting us into its mold, that men in their actions and certain environmental factors are becoming more feminized. They are. They're acting more and more like women. And on the flip side, many women, because of different modeling, different things, and I'm not talking about models, I'm just talking about things that they view, different things that come over the major media, they are becoming more and more like men. And this is known as androgyny, the blending of the sexes. This was never God's intention. Now, it's not to say that there's not men that are more masculine than other men. There has always been that. That's not to say there's not been women that are not more feminine than other women. There's always been that. But when those things get exaggerated, it becomes something of an abomination to God. God wanted the separation of the sexes so much, he created us 
1 Corinthians 11 with different types of hair. Hair is a symbol that there is a separateness in creation. Men are supposed to have short hair. We could go into that. Women are supposed to have long, uncut hair. I didn't write it. This is scripture. This was believed throughout millennium until this end time antichrist generation. Look at history. It's always been that way. And then distinction in dress as well. The Bible says that if a man dresses like a woman, that is an abomination. This has traditionally been called transvestism. And a woman that dresses like a man. Now, this is all basic. And, and it's a shame. You used to didn't even have to tell your kids this. Little boys knew they were little boys. They went around running, getting bulldozers. And little girls got Barbie and started brushing their hair. Said, Ooh, look at Barbie. And all of this. Now, unfortunately, the very basics of creation have to be explained to people. And they're trying to outlaw even speaking the very basics of creation to people. <laughs> that God created man and woman. A Lutheran pastor got up and preached out of Genesis 18 and 19 in a European country was jailed for 17 days just for quoting that scripture because it was considered a hate crime. And so um, I would prayerfully, before you vote, I would prayerfully vote for the people that are not promoting a satanic agenda upon the world. You may choose not to vote. You're a grown human being. That's your choice. <laughs> I'm an apostolic man of God. I have to preach the Bible to you. That's what I have to do. And that's God's choice, and, and I choose to follow it. Can you say amen? amen? Amen. Some of you are not excited about this message this morning. I can already tell. And it's just I haven't even got started. And so... We are not to dress. Men should not wear dresses. Women should not wear that, the Bible says, which pertains to a man. To do so is confusion. It is an abomination. When you get to Revelation 21 and 8, everyone who is an abomination ends up in the lake of fire. So this is just the word of God. So we come to verse number 4 of Psalm 8. Enough of the basic biology lesson. What is man that thou art mindful of him? The Hebrew word for man is anosh, and it merely means mortal. This is quoted in Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 6. So what is man that thou art mindful that Your mind, God, at times is full of man. It's full. What can I do to say that we are the bride, we are the body, we are the fullness of him that filleth all in all? And so God's mind is filled with mankind. He cares about your prayer requests. He cares about your needs. He cares about your worship. He cares about the love that you have for him. He cares about every person. It is not God's will that any should perish. Now let me just say this. Now we had a horrible tragedy in Orlando. 49 people were killed in a gay bar, a Latino gay bar. There was a Baptist minister in Sacramento, California that said, basically, we should not mourn them, we should be rejoicing. Now, the scripture says this, God does not have pleasure at the death of the wicked. Jesus hung on a cross for them. And so, we know homosexuals can be saved based on 1 Corinthians chapter 6, because it says, such were some of you. So, Christians are not into gay bashing. We are not. We don't take homosexuals out somewhere. We don't hit them with baseball bats. We don't kill. We don't do anything. We don't make derogatory slurs against them. What we do is we present the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's like somebody who smokes, dips, chews, drinks alcohol, strips, hookers, greed, just sins, lies, whatever else. It is a sin that Jesus Christ hung on a cross for. So you have to keep that very clear that Jesus Christ loves everyone. And uh, we have seen homosexuals, many of you may not have known they were homosexuals, speak in tongues around this altar. We have on multiple occasions. We have seen homosexuals, people that were practicing that lifestyle, get baptized in Jesus' name right here at New Life. 
since I have been here. And so um, God desires that. What we cannot do is reaffirm their sexual choices because it is not inherent, it is not genetic, it is choices that they make. They say, well, I've always had that attraction. Well, that is because they were born with a sinful nature. And the sinful nature had that attraction. But it had nothing to do with their genetics. Again, cut them open. We're well, not cut them open. Just take some DNA from them. Let's say that. Their DNA is going to be male or female. It's like uh, Bruce Jenner. Take his DNA. His DNA is male. It is not female. He's not whatever his first name says. He's already regretting his decision. Um, John Hopkins University stopped performing these surgeries because they said it is a mental disorder. And it has a huge rate of suicide after a few years. People are not happy. So these are all satanic deceptions. They have nothing to do with biology. It all has to do with the fall, a sinful nature, and demons trying to deceive. Look, people say, well, we got power over the devil. So the devil can make people deceive themselves in their most biological humanity. He can. And so let's turn about mindful. If you don't mind, let's everybody say mindful. Psalm 111, verse 5. Psalm 111, verse 5. And I do appreciate you as a congregation because you're praying, you're coming to church, you're living for God, and this is actually pushing back the night. The church is the pillar and the ground of the truth. So this is the reason we encourage you to have a prayer closet, encourage you to read the Word of God, which is the Word of truth. We encourage you to come to church, which is the pillar and ground of the truth. The Bible says come to church the more often as you see that day approaching. Why? Because if you're not careful, the world will fit you and I into its mold and we will begin to call good evil and evil good. And it is happening when we went to Tallahassee the other day to celebrate the Rowan's 54th wedding anniversary. We passed a church that was started uh, from an apostolic church. It is the MCC church, and it is gay apostolics. They have holiness standards. They believe in baptism in Jesus' name. They speak in tongues and have expressive worship, and they are homosexual. And uh, now we know they would not speak in tongues as the Holy Spirit gives the utterance. It may be a, uh, another spirit or human spirit, but it is not <laughs> as the Spirit of God gives the utterance. And so, uh, this is a strong delusion. Always remember this too. In Isaiah and in 2 Thessalonians, it said that there was going to come a strong delusion on the world. That people would believe a lie and be damned. And saying that word scripturally, not in a cursing sense. But that is just what scripture re records. And so, that strong delusion. And now, it doesn't say a delusion. It says a strong delusion. And so people won't even know they're deluded. And there's many people that don't know they're deluded out there. So, Psalm 111 says this. It starts off, verse 1, Praise ye the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. Verse 5, He hath given meat unto them that fear him. He will ever be mindful of his covenant. We are in covenant with God. When we are born again, the new birth is about entering into covenant with God. He shed his blood. That is the blood of the covenant. He was buried. He rose again. In covenants, there's a giving of gifts. He gives us his Holy Spirit, and we give him our bodies. We give him our souls, our spirits. We give him ourselves living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto him, which is our reasonable service. Abraham had a covenant with God. And so God says, can I hide from my friend? When you enter into covenant, you become friends of God. There's many people, and, and I hate to say this, I don't even want to bring this up because I'm not going to be able to elaborate, but they mistranslate scripture when it says we're servants of God. 
they would say, well, we're slaves of God. Now, be very careful of that. That's actually a mistranslation from the Greek. And we're servants. But then Jesus said, I've no longer called you servants, but friends. So we're servants, but we're also friends of God. That means we have a relationship with God because we've entered into covenant with him. A slave has no choice in the matter. Humans have free choice in the matter. We're friends of God. Okay? And so Abraham became a friend, and so God said, well, as a friend, I'm, I'm going to show him what I'm going to do on the earth to Sodom and Gomorrah. But then also, as a friend, in covenant relationship, if you ask me for anything, I have to give it to you. When Livingston was in Africa, Dr. Livingston, I presume, we've heard that little phrase. When Livingston was in Africa, he had made a covenant with a certain chieftain there. The chieftain said, you take this rod, and wherever you go throughout the covenant, you show this rod, and they are obligated, since I'm a king, they are obligated to give you anything that you ask. Well, this was in the 1860s. And so he's in... You know, what's known as the dark continent. That's not talking about color of skin. It was talking about just the mystery shout, shrouding it. And just, the, you know, there's no paved roads hardly and all this kind of stuff. And here he is walking through. And he said every time he would get in trouble or cannibals would go to eat him, he would show the rod and they would say, you're friends with the king. So that king, we're friends with him. That means you're our friend. And so... In the covenant, whatever you ask has to be done. So Abraham, God said to Abraham, said, I want your son, your firstborn, of whom everything, all the nations of the world are going to be blessed. I want him. I want you to kill him. Abraham, the, the imagery here in Genesis 22 is so fascinating. If you read the, the, closely the nuances, because he says he woke up early in the morning and, and saddled, you know, his, his writing instrument. He, he saddled his dog. He said, I'm getting up early because he knew he had to fill the, the covenant. And as he walked, it says, and he lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. Now, he saw it physically, but what did Jesus say in John 8? Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. So God gave him a prophetic picture of Calvary. And so God was telling Abraham, I'm not asking you to do anything with your son that I'm not going to do with my son. That's what's going on in Genesis chapter 22. Amen. And we find out in Hebrews 11, Abraham, since God had showed him all these things before all, he had already made up his mind. He said, well, I know in Isaac all the nations of the world are going to be blessed. And so out of his seed is going to become Messiah, and I'm going to kill him. Only explanation, God's going to raise him from the dead. And that's how he was able to, to say in Genesis 22, 8, and some of your modern translations totally miss this prophecy. Isaac said, well, here's the wood. Here's the fire. Where's the sacrifice? And Abraham prophetically, because he'd seen it far off, he said, God is going to provide himself the sacrifice. God is going to provide himself the sacrifice. So let's everybody say covenant. covenant. You, we have a new covenant. We're not the Abrahamic covenant, so to speak. We're in the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant, the new covenant. And so God is ever mindful of his covenant with you. The key is, are we ever mindful of our covenant with him? Because he is ever, he's always like Wayne Lloyd over in Germany 33 years ago. You got the Holy Ghost. And got baptized in Jesus' name. You entered into covenant. I gave you everything. Now, I expect everything from you. Everything, you know, God owns tithes and all. But I want your body. I want, you know, if I say go to wherever, you got to go. That's what I want. we got to be humble. And so he's ever mindful of his covenant with you. When you're walking down the street, God is like, that is a blessed man right there. 
I'm always thinking of my covenant with Wayne Lloyd. But the key to life is for us to always be thinking of the covenant, our part of the covenant with God. That we give ourselves living sacrifices, holy, that's entire, acceptable, which is just our reasonable service. Think about it. Here we are. One sin relegates us to an eternity in the lake of fire. That's right. We got worms crawling through us. We're like, ah, ah, ah. Sister Walter and I were talking about this yesterday. You know, the first 10 quadrillion years is the first millisecond. And we're like, ah, ah. We're just screaming, hollering in pain. And, and we're remembering, according, evidently, according to Luke 16, the, the times we missed, the times we sat on an apostolic pew and didn't humble ourselves and didn't give ourselves. We're just sitting there. There was like, ah, 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 we're just screaming. And so while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so the, the enormity of the covenant, for him to just say, now I want you to live, I don't want you to live. Satan sends you to hell. Hell hath expanded herself. Matthew 25, 41, hell was created for the devil and his angels, not for you. And so God says, now I want you to enter into covenant with me. Whatever I've got belongs to you. As long as whatever you've got belongs to me. It's two-way street. See, that's where the word of faith movement misses it sometimes. They forget their obligations to the covenant. Amen. They're just health and wealth. They want to come in one way. They forget that it's going another way. And sometimes they don't enter into covenant correctly either. They're not entering in because you got to come according to the rules of the covenant. And uh, the rules of the covenant succinctly are Acts, it's Acts 2.38. Acts, that's just the rules of the covenant. And then be ye holy as I'm holy. And uh, you have to know who you're in covenant with, obviously. Now, we know actually there is a fulfillment of the gospel. It's not necessarily the gospel itself. There's finite, but it is a fulfillment of the gospel. It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So he will, let's go back to verse 5, Psalm 11. He will ever be mindful. Let's everybody say mindful. mindful. God is mindful of his covenant. So when you enter in, when you get baptized in Jesus' name, when you repent, see, repentance is so important because you're turning your back on the world towards Jesus. How do we say, with the world behind me and the cross before? You know, that's repentance. Turning my back on the world, I'm turning it towards Jesus Christ. What's happening in the world today, Laodicean religion, turns people halfway. And that, they're lukewarm. I love Jesus and I'm worldly. Come on. They're not turning their back on the world. And so then they go down in waters of baptism in Jesus' name and become a new creature once they've received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That is God's part of the covenant. The gift is his name. You now have his name. In the Old Testament, it's been said that God took the H out of the yod ve yod ve the, the Tetragrammaton, the Yahweh, Jehovah, and put it in Abram. Abram meant high father. When God put the H in there, he made it Abraham. To Sarai, he said, no, it's not Sarai any longer. It is Sarah. Hey. And so Abram means high father. Abraham means father of a multitude. Yeah. In the new covenant, we take on the full name of deity. Jesus. And then we, and the gift he gives is the Holy Spirit, which is the spirit of deity. And so he is, once you become, I firmly believe, backsliders out there, that because we get this from Luke 15, what did the prodigal dad do? You know, we name that prodigal son. Nowhere in Luke 15 says the prodigal son. We named it. Some people have accurately said prodigal means prodigious, exceeding. That the dad was the one that was prodigal. Because he gave the elder son money and the younger son. And the dad sat there and waited every day. And he had a fatted calf just waiting. I wonder if he didn't just feed that calf by faith. And so the father, but notice this. 
Now, we know God knocks on the heart's door. But the symbolism here is the father at that moment didn't go looking for him. Because the reason that typology had to be in Luke 15 is because then there would be salvation, so to speak, where you're at and not in the father's house. Amen. Because God is wanting you to come back to the Father's Praise house. It. Hallelujah. For sal and that doesn't mean you can't pray through out there. That's not even the issue because he repented out there. That's right. But he didn't just keep wandering around. He had to come back to the Father's house. Amen. Okay. So God is ever mindful of his covenant with you. He just always thinks about it. He's always thinking of you in covenant relationship. So that's the reason when he says, love not the world, neither things of the world, be holy as I'm holy, all he's saying is maintain covenant with me. Maintain covenant with me. If it's bondage to you, it is because you're not dead to sin and alive to God. Amen. If it is bondage, then it's not being communicated. Something is messed up in the covenant. Because the covenant is meant for love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. It's joy unspeakable. It's rebuilding the tabernacle of David. So that's what covenant is. So if, if all you got out of covenant is a list of rules, you're in trouble. Amen. It's because we're going back to this. What we began with, those that are in covenant are friends. You're in relationship with God. It's the greatest thing in the world. What we're wanting, you know, for every denominational person. I, I used to be denominational. You used to be denominational. What we want is for them to come in full covenant. And that's not being... If we begin to justify them before they're justified with Jesus Christ, then we've done this as horrible disservice. That's right. I'm glad... When I was a in a denomination, they didn't say I was okay. Then they said, no, you need to come further. You need to come into this thing. And so that's what compromise, and when we say the horrors of compromise, the little leaven leavens the whole lump, mentioned a couple times, that's what we're talking about. We've got to bring people to the Father's house. And uh, God is good. And it is fascinating to me, people that live in the Father's house can get so bitter. Come on. They got everything. Look at there. They're sitting there dancing over that backside of that homo, getting a holy ghost over there, praying back through, and everybody shouting. I've been here every service. I got here at 8 a.m. for music practice. Somebody needs a shout over me. See, that's the, that's the attitude of the elder brother. Come on. They don't realize the 99 attitude. That's right. Come that on. you leave the 99. Now remember, when you get them, you don't leave them out there. You bring them back to the flock. That's right. Yeah. All right. Co let's everybody say covenant. covenant. So man, what is man that you're mindful of him? Well, what man is, is man and women. Mankind is a covenant creature. One of the worst things I've ever done is just looked at that clock. I should have never looked at that clock. Psalm 115 verse 12 says this. The Lord, let's everybody say the Lord. the Lord. That's Jehovah, that's God Almighty. Now some people, the reason people struggle sometimes thinking there's two, binary. It, there's, there's Jehovah and then there's Jesus. And in a sense that's true, it's spirit and flesh, spirit and humanity. But the reason is because when you see Lord here, that is Jehovah. Jesus in Hebrew would have been Jehovah salvation. It would have been Jeho it would have just been Jehovah with a U comma A on top, as we transliterate in English. So it's very clear Jesus is claiming to be Jehovah all of the time. As a matter of fact, when it says the Lord has become my salvation, it's okay, brother, and by the way. You're teaching on Jesus or Yeshua. How do you say the name of God in English? A lot of people are watching that online. It's evidently a very fascinating thing on the New Life web channel. I did want to say that. 
So, um, you have Jehovah. This is probably the best way to pronounce it. But Jehovah, the Lord has become my salvation. It's Jehovah has become my Joshua. Well, how you would say Jesus, basically in Hebrew, and we're not going to go into the YJ thing today. That's a whole lesson in itself. Is Joshua. When you right. see Joshua, like in Acts 7 or the book of Hebrews, many of the time that's talking about Jesus. And so it's like Jehovah has become my Joshua, my Jesus. Jehovah became my Jesus. That's what it means when it says the Lord has become my salvation in Scripture. Jehovah, you can look it up in your uh, interlinears or on the computer, your blue letter Bible. It'll just say that. It's, it's very clear. So verse 12 of Psalm 115, the Lord hath been mindful of us. Now again, all you do, put those two words together. My, his mind's been full of us. The God of glory. The one who exists outside of space and time. His mind is full of you. Sister Payne, I, I love you. That's what he's thinking. You made covenant with me years ago. I forget the brother's name up there. But anyhow, I knew of the brother. But, and so his mind is full of that. So the goal of life, to be biblical men on this Father's Day, to honor our Heavenly Father, is for our mind to be full of his covenant. Amen. Now look at this when it says his mind, the Lord has been mindful of us. What will he do? He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless them that fear the Lord because the covenant goes both ways, both small and great. The Lord shall increase you more and more. Why? Because you're in covenant. And since God is the author of all blessing and you're in covenant with him, you can't help but be blessed. That's right. We sit there and beg to be blessed sometimes, and there's nothing wrong with asking God to bless you. But we're already blessed because the Creator lives on the inside of us. That's right. So the Lord shall increase you more and more, and you and your children. Solomon was turned out to be a bad guy. But when the prophet came, he said, I'm not going to take the thing because of David. Because your, your children will be blessed. I'm not going to take the kingdom because of David. You are blessed of the Lord which made heaven and earth. The heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's. But the earth has he given to the children of men. We were able to, to eat with some IBC students. I just happened to be passing through on a musical tour on Thursday. So we went out to eat with them. Some of the students, they said, well, we've been sitting around asking. We thought we'd ask you. You teach science in the Bible. want to know this question. Where is the end of the universe? And I said, well, scientists, because of the Big Bang, they constantly look for the end of the universe. And we constantly think we may have found it, and then we find out that there's things for Hundreds of millions and millions of light years beyond what we thought. But now what if everything we're seeing in the near-Earth orbital telescopes, of which a whole telescope is one, what if everything we're seeing is like this? And the universe keeps going as far as the world is, as far as our universe is. And that's all we can see. And we're creating, trust me, God knew we would be looking. Because we're on an arm in the Milky Way. Our solar system is that we are surrounded by 
interstellar gas. There's only a 10% window that you can observe the universe, and the Earth is in that 10% window. And even some scientists have converted to Christianity because they said something, somewhere, wanted us to look. That didn't just happen. So what if we're looking at the Hubble telescope thinking, where is the end of these hundred trillion uh, you know, universes and solar systems and galaxies? And all we're seeing is this, and they extend. The real question is, is what extends on the outside of the universe because material is not infinite. Obviously, it would be heaven. This would be the dwelling place of God. It would be a spiritual dimension. And, uh, and his mind's full of you. Amen. So David looked and said, what is man? That you are mindful of all lives. I'll tell you, you're creating the image of God. And God loves you. And he cares for you every day. He's fulfilling his part of the covenant. we got to fulfill our part of the covenant. And say, God, here I am, whatever you want. Thank here you, I Jesus. Am. We sing a song, I love it. It's called Here I Am to Worship. Here I Am to Bow Down. Here I Am to Say That You're My God. You're all. That's what God wants. Hallelujah. Why don't you find somebody to pray with? Just ask God to bless them really good. That on this Father's Day, our minds will be full of the Father's covenant. Let's pray together. God, I glorify you. I love you. I love your word. God, let us all be mindful of your covenant, Jesus, because you are mindful of your covenant. You're mindful of us. God, I glorify you. I love you. Glory to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I love you, King Jesus. I glorify you. I exalt you. Infuse to all of us the power of the covenant that we're your people. God, it's not our gospel. We can't compromise it. We can just proclaim it in love. Hallelujah. I glorify you. I love you. And Jesus, whatever you ask of us, we're obligated to give. But God, what prayer is, whatever we ask of you, if we ask according to your will, not to heap it upon our own lust in the world part, but whatever we ask, you will give it to us. Because we're in covenant with you, Jesus. I glorify you. I love you, King Jesus. Thank you for the power of the Holy Ghost. I glorify you. God, there's healing in the covenant because there's only blessing in you. God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, there's only miracles in the covenant. God, I love you. I worship you, God. Please total and complete healing on your people. I love you, King Jesus. Help us to live in covenant with you, Jesus. That is the New Testament, the new covenant. Oh, God, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Church, I love you, but more than anything, God loves us all. Amen. And uh, it's not his will that any should perish. I just want to share the good news. You know, what if a, 50, a guy worth $50 trillion died and he said, everybody's listed in the will. I'd probably show up to see what my part was. Well, we read the new covenant every week. We're just sitting here saying, you're named in a will. You're named in a will. Amen. And you get the greatest thing. You get see, it's a it's a gospel of extremes. You either get the lake of fire or you get heaven. You get rulership, kings, and priesthood of the increase of his government. There is no end. You either get that cities of gold, you know, a new Jerusalem city, mansions of gold, street of gold. You either get that, or you get eternity in hell. I don't know about you. Knowing the terror of the Lord, persuade we men. <laughs> I want in that place. And no sacrifice, no persecution, nothing we go through 
is, uh, is worth missing that. We need to pray as we close this. Let's pray for uh, Joseph Mancuso. This is McCare's dad. He is still alive. They have not expected him to make it through the night for a little over a week. And, uh, you know, and, and Sister McCare said, why is he sitting here suffering? I said, well, you don't know. He could have been speaking in tongues for three hours the other night. You don't know. I said, you may get to heaven and find out the prayers that he's praying right now. In his mind, you lead a blessed life, and when you get to heaven, you realize it. He says, we don't know what's going on there, but we need to pray for him. Brother Smith, if you don't mind, could you come lead us to the Lord in prayer for uh, Joseph Mancuso, McCare's father? Oh, my God, bless Joseph right now, my God. Hallelujah, my God. You know of what he need, have need of before he asked. Oh, my God, hallelujah. You know how, my God, to supply all the need. You know how. Hallelujah, my God. You've got the hairs on his head numbered, my God. In thy blessed name, Lord Jesus. Oh, my God, hallelujah. Manifest our presence. Hallelujah by his bedside right now. Touch his hand right now. Hallelujah, my God. Raise him up. Oh, my God. Hallelujah. Lift him up. Hallelujah. Into your blessed presence. My God, bless him, my God. Hallelujah. Oh, my God. With hallelujah visions and my God. Hallelujah revelations. And oh, my God. Thank you, Lord. All thy greatness and thy goodness. My God, bless his mind. Bless his heart. Bless his soul. To behold. Oh, my God, your oneness, hallelujah, your mighty acts, your glorious deeds, my God. Hallelujah, bless his hallelujah. heart to rejoice right now, my God. Hallelujah. hallelujah, my God. Oh, my God, because we know, hallelujah, your intent, you're so mindful of us, and your intent is to wipe away every tear from my eye. My God, to remove the pain and the sorrow. So in thy blessed name, we declare right now that with your stripes, we were healed. We declare, my God, hallelujah, we are healed. Oh, my God, that you, hallelujah, are the God of our salvation. Oh, my God, and right now, hallelujah, as your church prays, as your church prayed for Peter, hallelujah, your church is praying right now. Hallelujah, my God, for the angel. My God, to bump him. Hallelujah, wake him up. My God, tell him to come on. Follow me in the name of the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Out into the gates. Hallelujah. Of your blessed presence. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Show yourself strong. Hallelujah. On this behalf right now. And somebody shout in the name of the Lord Jesus. Say it again in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. I was also going to say, she lives right up the street. If anybody feels late, just drop some food by. Or if you have five, ten, twenty extra dollars just to help them, it'd be greatly appreciated. They're just full watch there. Preston was able to spend all week at camp. His life he was just transformed. We're very grateful Thank for you, that. Lord That's McCare's son, Preston. So God bless you. Let's take a few moments break and come back in.